My name is Cyril Chantler. I'm the chairman of USAIL Partners. And it's my pleasant duty to thank you all very much for coming. There are nearly a thousand delegates registered for this conference. From health, social care, from the third sector, they include policymakers, commissioners, and providers of health and social care. And the fact that so many of you expressed an interest, I think, is a cause for some optimism for the future. But also, congratulations on being here. I think you will find this was the place to be, and those who are not here, as Shakespeare said in Henry V, will regret it. Now, I don't think we're going to be reenacting the Battle of Agincourt. So why is this the place to be? It's the place to be because long-term conditions are a challenge to all of us, including myself. Indeed, I'm partly here because of enlightened self-interest. But I'm not alone. At my age, in Scotland, 90% of people have a long-term condition, 60% have two, 40% have three, and 10 have five or more. Now, the NHS was not designed for this. In 1948, when it started, life expectancy for males was 68 years. Long-term conditions account for 75% of the costs of the National Health Service. And the NHS itself is facing a deficit of £30 billion per annum in, by 2020. So the Nicholson challenge is getting worse. We are in very serious trouble. According to Dr. Foster, 29% of our hospital beds are occupied by people who would not be there if they received good care in the community. It's almost as though you can't get into our hospitals because you can't get out of them. We are running at over 90% bed occupancy, which is frankly unsafe. But like Holland, which runs around 75% and has 160 primary care centres, which are open 24-7. But it gets worse. We have the second worst record for amenable mortality for both communicable and non-communicable disease in the seven, 17 richest countries in the world. Only the United States of America is worse. We are the second fattest nation on earth. We need to strive to improve health to the end of life. Biologically, few people are going to live beyond 100, but we want to strive for square wave death, if I can put it like that, that you're pretty well and active until the time comes, like Solomon Grundy. We do have to do better. We have, in Stephen Dorrell's words, to reimagine healthcare. We have to find new ways of promoting health especially for our fellow citizens who are socially marginalised. We have to find ways to change harmful behaviours. And it seems to me a good place to start, I wonder why we didn't think about this before, is to listen to the patients and the people who are affected. And it, this shouldn't be a novel idea because they are the experts. As Jarma said in an editorial a while ago, the patient is the pilot. The healthcare professional may help as a navigator. And this conference is about exploring new ways of working. We have a patient jury of 12 people who will be watching and commenting and advising throughout, and we need to listen. We need to think, we need to research, we need to learn, and that is why we at UCL Partners are really pleased to be involved in this meeting. It's what we're here to do. At UCL Partners, we have five main programs dealing with cancer, cardiovascular conditions, women, children, and uh, long-term conditions, but most importantly, mental health. And mental health is particularly important in today's context because it's the source of the, of the commonest uh, feature of a long-term condition. But also, if we're going to change behavior, 
they are going to have to advise and help us how to do this. We are delighted that the Department of Health and Dr. Martin McShane have invited us to help and the Dodds have engaged to organize the meeting. We're all in this together. And that is why the House of Care has been adopted as a metaphor to frame our thoughts around patient-centered care. Please may I now invite uh, Martin McShane and Jonathan Hope to tell you more. Martin. Thank you very much, Cyril. Um, I'm only going to speak briefly because I get a second bite at the cherry in a few minutes. So just to say that it's a privilege for me to have the job as domain director within NHS England, working with four other domain directors focused on supporting better outcomes and high quality care for all in NHS England. I've had an eclectic journey arriving at this position. I trained just down the road. I then spent the 1980s as a surgeon in training, research, and practice. And then, for reasons best known to myself, I went into general practice for 14 years. And then, I decided I would have a third career and became a commissioner. And I hope I can bring some of that experience, knowledge, and insight to bear to support the job that NHS England has to do, to support high-quality care for all. And one of the things that NHS England needs to do is be a support to communities, professionals, individuals who require the services of the NHS and other parts of the system to improve their qualities of life. Now, one of the things about this conference, which I'm really keen to have, is that it is not about chalk and talk. It is about listening and committing to action. So one of the things I'm going to ask is if everyone in the room before they leave the conference, no matter how small it is, would make a pledge. And there are pledge walls around uh, at the conference and we want you to tell us what you would commit to doing uh, to help NHS England do the job it needs to do. But most of all, it is about the people we serve. And I'm glad, though uh, slightly terrified, that we have a people's jury here. Um, I live in a village called Shire Oaks, and uh, it's called the Shire Oak because it's at the junction of three counties um, where in the Middle Ages they held the assizes. And you can imagine what the oak was used for. Um, I hope that won't happen, but I hope that we do get that feedback from the jury to tell us, are we landing this right? Are we getting it right for people with long-term conditions? And can we enhance the quality of their life? Uh, which is what I pledge to do as Domain Director. So thank you very much for coming today. I'm going to hand over to someone far more important, Jonathan, and let you listen to him. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. As you know, my name is Jonathan Hope, and I would like to start out with a thank you. I would like to thank everyone here, but particularly Martin and also Ed, for agreeing, I think courageously, to allow a person with a long-term condition to address the conference, when usually the bigwigs are talking. Thank you. I'll briefly tell you a little bit about my own background before I go on to share with you what I believe are four of the key needs of people living with long-term conditions. I was diagnosed with kidney failure when I was 12. My kidneys failed when I was 16 at school. Since then, that's 32 years ago, I have had an um, extraordinary journey. I have suffered unimaginably despite receiving good and sometimes exceptional care. I've had 15 years on 
dialysis, much of that on a kidney machine. I spent years in hospital. I've had more operations than I can even remember. And I've had four transplants. The four things I'd like to highlight in the next eight or so minutes are, well, before I go on to tell you what the first one is, I'd like to ask you all a question, perhaps to take you into your own imagination. Instead of coming here today, perhaps today you went to your GP and you had a few blood tests a little while back and he's coming to tell you the news. The news, I should warn you, isn't great. You've got kidney failure. Everyone here, except for those with long-term conditions, has got kidney failure. What would you want? As the years span out before you, 20, 30, 40 years, you hope, what would you want? Suddenly you'd realize your life, your health, your well-being, your employment, your relationships, everything you've cared for so far, everything that's made you who you are, is up for grabs. What would you want? Well, it's taken me 25 years to work out what I've wanted. It's a quality of life, a day-to-day -day quality of life, despite your condition. Why quality of life? I believe the phrase quality of life captures the real patient pathway. In other words, the 96% or 94% of time when we're outside of the healthcare system, not directly supported or cared for by yourselves, daily facing often a list of symptoms that seek to destroy our quality of life, struggling, suffering, and hurting as we go. Quality of life also captures the fact that it's not just a physical ordeal or challenge. No, far from it. Would you separate your physical, mental, emotional well-being on a daily basis? I suspect not. We do not have that luxury. I always remember speaking to an elderly chap who was on a kidney machine. It's a while ago now, but I remember the words until I die. I asked him what his quality of life was. Assuming the best was 10, a flu was 9. He said 3 out of 10. Before I could continue, he said, you know, I fought Hitler for four years. But this dialysis, it's impossible. The second thing I'd like to ask is self-care. It's not within the NHS. It's not integrated into the culture of every meeting I've ever had with the NHS. But I got lucky because 10 years ago, I met the most remarkable person. She saw in me something I couldn't even imagine in myself. She saw in me a potential to help myself, and not just to help myself, but in time to overcome the nature of my condition, to achieve a good and staggering quality of life. In the next month, she taught me how to dialyze at home very quickly. I moved home with my machine. I never looked back. She was the one who changed everything for me because she saw something in me I didn't know I have. I asked that we all see things in people that we do not think they have. We need more Barbara Keynes. The third thing I'd like to suggest that we need is often referred to as PPI, involvement and engagement. And I don't mean in shared decision making. I mean in designing services. I mean in choosing where funding goes, at the very top, so it filters down to the very bottom. Why is this important? Well, about seven years ago, I went to Holland and I went with some clinicians, first trip I'd ever been on, where clinicians and I went together. And we were investigating a new type of dialysis treatment. Never heard of it before. It was the gold standard 30 years ago. Still never heard of it. It's called nocturnal dialysis. And what seemed to be happening was the clinicians were ticking all the boxes, 
Yes, your rear clearance, good. Yes, we've got the systems in place. We'll be able to plan and put them in place, etc. I wanted to know one question. And that was, what did the patients think? What did the people living on this machine want? And what did they think? I asked a patient, and he told me, 10 of them have got together recently. And what he told me, I didn't believe. I literally didn't believe. It shocked me so much. He said, we feel so well, we don't want to transplant. Now, when you've spent 20 years fighting every day of your life to stay alive, to keep healthy, and to get that transplant, a working, functional transplant, someone says that to you, you don't know what to say. But you know whatever is being introduced here will change lives. Within the year, due to some amazing work by both clinicians and patients, it was introduced, a national first. Now that's real patient engagement. The last thing I'd like to talk about is outcomes. This is the fourth thing that I believe is important. Now I've already highlighted the importance of quality of life. Outcomes, what do we mean by outcomes? What outcomes are we looking to achieve? in our own lives. The outcomes I believe we're looking to achieve are those that are designed around people living their lives. We're looking again for holistic outcomes. You know, 15 years ago, I achieved self-mastery in terms of clinical measures. I was able to say to my clinician, whilst we're on a trip to America, where the Americans have just said, sorry, we can't do your dialysis session. I'm going to be OK. I don't need to be airlifted home. He looked at me, rather skeptically, I must say. He said, why? I said, I can tell you what my potassium is right now. It's 4.3. And he, rather skeptically, said, I think it's 4.4, <laughs> which suggests you don't quite have the control you wish. Three hours later, after negotiating the US healthcare system, we found out. 4.3. But what was my quality of life like at the time? It wasn't great. I'd achieved what the clinicians had inspired me to achieve, but I hadn't achieved what I wanted to achieve. So PROMS, patient reported outcome measures, measures that we ourselves testify to, the effectiveness of a treatment or other. Very lastly, I'd just like to also add my own thanks for all the individuals who've made it today on the, we originally marketed it, so to speak, as the People's Jury. I think they've now relabeled themselves People's Panel. I think the reason for that is because this is about taking the amazing insights and irreplaceable experience of those who actually live with conditions day in, day out, night in, night out, decade in, decade out, at face value. So I'd like to thank all of them for coming here today. Thank you.